Hello, Jen. Welcome back to another interview. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Oliver. How are you? You look oh, good. Doing fine. Yeah. I mean, in the middle of a lockdown, but doing fine. Yeah. Yeah. You poor things. I feel for you over there. As I mentioned before, here in Australia, we're um, doing quite well compared to the rest of the world. So yeah, we feel for you guys. Hope it all gets better soon. What yeah. are we going to talk about, my friend? Well, we'll start talking about uh, the video you released just a few weeks ago, the uh, levitation video. I think it was pretty cool. And you, uh, in that video, you levitated an uh, object inside of a balloon. And as we are talking about it, I'll again insert a clip of it so people can see what we're talking about. Um, my first question related to that is, is levitating an object and overcoming gravity more difficult than moving an object laterally on a surface? Gee, <laughs> you're good at this, aren't you, Ollie? It's all difficult. Uh, it's all as difficult as each other. I mean, the moment you enter into something with, oh, I'm going to levitate, you know, that just saying that brings about doubt with your, you just by saying that. Um, I am going to levitate. Just those three words separates me from the thing that you are going to levitate. So it doesn't work that way. It's a matter of being, being the levitator, being the levitated, and being the levitation all at the same time is how that works. Um, in regards to asking if it's easy or not, um, Okay, when a baby is learning to walk, would that, watching a baby learn to walk, would you consider that being easy or hard for the baby? I don't think the baby would consider it hard or easy. The baby is exploring and enjoying its newfound skills. If the baby, and I'll back up a little bit, as a, as a creature, we're quite lazy by nature. And I think if it was really, really hard, the baby would take a lot longer to start walking. If that makes any sense. Um, so when it comes into levitating, when it comes into any kind of PK work, you can't enter into it with words like, I wonder if I am going to do that. Can this be done? Um, all of those things separate you from what you're doing. You're already entering into it with doubt and labels. Uh, as we've spoken about before, using labels bars you from everything and anything. I'll just, this is going to seem like I'm going off track, but it's not. People, humans, we've been educated to replace truth with an opinion. And do you, do you know what I mean by that? We, you know, you, I might present something to you, a flower. I'll present a beautiful rose to you. Some people, excuse me, I'm just a little bit here. I'll, pre I'll present a, a rose to you. Some people would just go, ah, wonderful. Other people would go, oh, I can't smell that. You better keep that away from me. I have allergies to, to pollens. Therefore, the rose isn't a good thing for me. So these these are all opinions. Basically, I'm saying here is I'm presenting. If I'm handing you the rose. I'm presenting something. And if you want to add labels to that, it's beautiful. It's bright red. It's got a wonderful aroma and all the rest of it. But they are opinions outside of the human head. It's not wonderful outside of the human head. It's not lovely. It can't even say it's red. These are all human things. We're replacing the experience of the rose with labels and opinions. And at the end of it all, we go, oh, yeah, wasn't that all lovely? And we think that they've just been presented a rose and they think that they've enjoyed it and they enjoyed the experience, but they haven't. They've enjoyed the experience of their thoughts. So they haven't actually even enjoyed I have to use the word rose, okay, because we're talking to people here. <clears throat> it's, 
if I hand it to you and you have no thought process is going on, you will feel the velvetness of the petal. You will smell it, but you won't go, oh, how wonderful. Your body will just go, and you'll get goosebumps. And you, your mouth may even water. You may even salivate. All of this is coming from experiencing this object. Try it all over again and go, oh, give me the rose. I'm going to smell the rose and see if I can enjoy the smell of the rose. And try all of that and you watch the second time around. You won't get the salivating. You won't get the wondrous. Your eyebrows won't raise because you're looking at your thoughts. You've replaced the actuality with opinions and labels. And that's what takes, that's what separates us from reality. Now take that back to the balloon. It's exactly the same process. If you know there's a balloon there, that'll stop you. If you know that you're there trying to do some, trying to do something, that's enough to stop you. Just knowing that. Reality is outside of the thought process. It really is. And once you understand that and once you experience that to a certain point, um, all of these questions dissipate. It, it, it just becomes obvious how this is this is all working. Now, just to go off track a little bit, um, I this is <laughs> getting back to COVID. I have so much time on my hands to be able to explore these things. These are all new for me. Um, I've had three months of just being in a room with silence and stillness and observation and um, I've had the liberty to go deeper than I've had the chance or the time or the liberty to before. So I'm seeing more things. I'm <clears throat> touching up on things that I'm still yet to explore and moving something inside an isolated arena, as in a balloon, is brand new for me. I could also say that the moment that this entity was conceived, I was put in a balloon. So I could also say, on the other hand, I've been in a balloon all my life. We all have, and we call it a body. So you see, semantics. It can change one story into a completely different story just by having a different definition of the words that you're using. So how can they possibly be used to grasp reality? It's just not possible. It's ridiculous. It's like be like trying to eat potatoes with a with a human hair. It's not going to happen. Wrong tool. Unfortunately, we've been educated to praise the almighty human intellect as the new god, the new religion, and it's just going to go down the same rabbit holes the old religion did. It has nothing to do with reality. It has everything to do with being special, um, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go into that. I always pull up when we reach religion. You know that. So I have no idea what you asked me because I just went on for quite a while, but I think there was an answer in there somewhere, I hope. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so next next question coming up. Um, during one of our recent non-public conversations, you mentioned that you are working on improving your teleportation skills. Um, is there mm -hmm. any news in that field? The teleportation. Whilst I was working on figuring out and moving into how to make these things move inside an isolated area. One of the first things I was looking into is, let me back up a little bit. As you know, with mysticism, it is very, if, if you're going to be a mystic, you have to approach mysticism scientifically. You will have a look at something you will create an effect, you will get a certain outcome. You will then do it a second time. If you get the same outcome the second time, you've got something worth looking at. If you do it a third time and you still get the same outcome, now we have something close to a very good theory that could possibly be a fact. So then you keep looking into it. The reason I was doing this is because 
the mindset is to be the mover, the moved and the moving. That's the mindset, but that still doesn't say how that's working. How is that working? My knowledge of quantum physics, double split experiment and quantum entanglement kind of does give some answers to that. And as you well know, there are physicists all over the world that are starting to look into these things, the, the oneness of mind and, and all the rest of it. Um, and they're coming out with proof. They are demonstrating that these things are actually real. So they're catching up. I'm going to get into trouble for saying this, but scientists are catching up. Can I just sidetrack onto what I mean by that, if you don't mind? As a mystic, all right, I'm going to use a very, very simple science, psychology. Simple science, everyone can learn psychology very quickly. Just close your eyes and you've started. So with psychology, if you were to go to a psychologist and you're super depressed, and all of the rest of it through book learning and being told by professors and all the rest of it um the psychologist can go well you've got a lot of negative thoughts and this is causing you to be depressed and um um there's many things we can do about that you know you may be able to go and take some medication but i would have to send you a psychiatrist for that uh, but there are things we can do with it by adding or taking away or neutralizing certain chemicals within your body that still hasn't told the person who is depressed why it's happening. If you just explained his situation in terms that sounds clever. A mystic, on the other hand, will go in and use the technology of inner sight. You go in, still your mind, become very still, still your heart until you're very feeling very, very even and very calm. And then you have a negative thought on purpose. You bring up a negative thought. Upon that thought arriving or manifesting, you'll see your stomach will tense. You'll, you'll notice that your body starts to produce adrenaline. Your heartbeat starts to go up. You're watching the process. The adrenaline starts to build up inside you. Your heart beats faster. Your muscles start to tense. You start to shake. Now you're in a bad situation. You are now what they would call stressed and you have symptoms of stress. But by going in and watching this, you are seeing it. You are watching it happen from beginning to end, and you're seeing why it happens. You're also, if you're clever enough, and if you have the capacity, you will notice that whatever you are in there watching that process isn't actually depressed. You are watching the function of depression right there before you. But in that watching, you've separated yourself from it. These are things you won't get from your psychologist, of course. So the, the only difference between scientists and, and mystics is that a mystic, and as a scientist, we both understand that all of the elements that make up life, all of the elements that life bases itself on are here inside this body. Everything that we call life, Everything that we call being alive is right here inside your body. And the technology is in there. The fact you can close your eyes and see things inside your head means you have an internal eye. You have internal technology. That's no different to having uh, security cameras inside your building. So you now you can see in there. Once you're going in there, you can watch chemicals being produced. You can watch thoughts being produced. You can... You can control your heart rate. You can tr control your body temperature. You know, these are all scientific facts. You know, this is all being demonstrated and recorded for decades all over the world. This can happen. The only difference between the mystic at that point and the scientist is a scientist can also look in there, but the scientist relies on external t technology. A scientist will rely on um, machinery. Microscopes, electron microscopes, um, things that I probably can't even pronounce as far as technology goes today, but you get the general gist. So scientists and mystics are looking in the same direction. We're all doing the same thing, but mystics have been doing it for so long. We actually started way, way before the external technology had arrived. So 
we have mastered internal technology. That's the only difference. Scientists will have to pull up with their technology. They will have to go internally eventually. Um, but you will find at the end of the day, it's not about science and it's not about pure mysticism. It's the middle line between yin and yang. Science and mysticism have to come together and realize that we're not separate and never have been, have the same attitude, have the same direction, have the same objectives and the same passion, which is to uncover truth. That's that. I have no idea how I got to that, but anyway, it sounded good. Okay, but I'll have to pull you back a little on the main question. That was uh, thank you. The, the, <laughs> the news on teleportation. I think you diverged a little. I did. I diverged a lot. The news on teleportation is that uh, I have fallen into one of my own traps that I warn other people about. In that in my wanderings and ponderings and looking to figure out how I could manifest a teleportation effect, either my whole self or whatever, I, and looking into it deeply, I realized that I've already been doing it and everybody does it to a certain extent. And it has everything to do with identity and quantum entanglement. It has everything to do with that. It has everything to do with and <clears throat> with quantum entanglement. As you know, you have one, two halves of a particle, negative and a positive. If you take the positive and put it three galaxies away and you flick it, the other one. The one that you still have in your hand will respond to that. So this particle is already in two places at once and still connected. I'm, I'm talking scientifically here. Space and time seem to be not an object to this phenomenon. So this is where I'm delving when it comes into when it comes down to teleportation. It has everything to do with that. My theory at the moment, or my observation at the moment, is <sighs> if you can reconnect, if you can prompt those two halves of a particle that are in quantum entanglement, if you can prompt them to come back together, I my theory is that would produce teleportation. So if I have a whole bunch of, uh, if I have a whole bunch of particles that I have quantum entanglement with over there somewhere, and my need and my ability to reunite with those should take me to that place. This is all theory and it could be absolute shit, but you've got to start somewhere. I mean, we all thought the cosmos came from a god, but you know, obviously, <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that, but I did, and there we go. But today we know differently, you know, so that's where I'm at with that. Give me time, it's a big one. Oof. Anyway, let's go on. Okay. Moving on to the next question uh, What do side effects like levitation, telekinesis, and also telepathy tell us about the nature of reality? Oh, none of these things would be possible if we weren't all connected. If life wasn't connected, it would be impossible. And this is why most people and many people don't believe these things because most people don't see or understand or realize that everything is connected, that life is one, scientifically proven, mystically proven, spiritually proven. The fact that uh, you hurt when someone you love hurts is proof of connection, etc., etc. So if there was no 
connection, you wouldn't be able to move objects. If there was no connection, there would be no PK, there would be no ESP, but there obviously is. Um, and that's why it works. All that it does is points to something other, the fact that all things are connected. There's absolutely nothing you can do with any of these things. You know, you, you won't earn a living from being able to move a spoon and, unless it's to feed old people. Um, that's all it is. Life is incredible stuff. It's amazing. There are many, many, many things that life does that we haven't even come across. I can't even imagine yet, but, you know, it's coming. Um, and it's only our narrow mindedness that stops us from experiencing these things faster. Almost went into religion again then, but we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Shall I bring religion into it? You may. If religion hadn't started burning scientists hundreds and hundreds of years ago at the stake, we would be a hell of a lot more advanced today than we are. We would be crawling all over other planets. We probably wouldn't be using fossil fuels anymore, but we was, there's a very, very long period in our time in, in human history where we were suppressed kept away from reality, made not to think for ourselves, anything and everything that has to be, has to be through God or not at all. And um, that's created a lot of problems. I'm not saying it's evil. I'm not saying it's not evil. It's, uh, <laughs> as far as good and evil goes, if you take all of humanity off of this planet, where would you find good and evil? I'll leave that one with you. Was that an answer? It was. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so next question. And during one of our private exchanges of ideas, I shared my theory with you that the uh, increasing confusion and uncertainty we experience on a global scale, particularly this year, might loosen certain limitation, uh, limiting constraints of reality and allow more and also stronger paranormal effects to manifest themselves in the world. Um, what are your thoughts on this theory? Have you had or heard about any experiences that speak for or against it? And another way to put it uh, would be, is the rule set that governs the physical world fixed or can it also evolve? Oh, everything evolves. Even spirit evolves. <laughs> um, no. When it comes to reality and things being fixed and all the rest of it, let's just have a look at something other. Let's go to Titan for a moment, the planet, the moon, Titan. If you go there now, it has an extremely similar landscape to Earth. It has lakes and rivers. It has oceans um, and it's all flowing. But these flowing lakes and rivers are methane. It's liquid methane. It's so cold that water is harder than steel. And you think about that. If you lived there, we would be welding and hitting and bashing ice in the same way we hit and bend and weld and work with metal on this planet. And that's almost unimaginable water being so hard we can build bridges out of it and all the rest of it that's just incredible so no nothing is fixed if if suddenly the the sun became a lot colder we would be like that metal everything would change nothing is fixed everything evolves change is the only certainty in life these are all facts they're not beliefs you know, you just got to look out your window for a few moments to see that. The fact that mind and, you know, we control our lives with our minds. If we didn't have a mind, we would be, anyway, let's not go there. We control our lives with minds. We 
shape our societies with our minds. We shape our our personal lives with our minds. None of that is obviously fixed. We can change anything just by changing the mind. The problem is we are very reluctant to change our minds. Now, the question is, are we educated to be that way? Is it fear that makes us like that? Change being the only certainty should be something that you should relish, and yet most of the world can't deal with change. The status quo is what most people are aiming for, is to keep a permanent happiness, permanent home, permanent relationship, permanent this, permanent that. And that's not possible. Everything changes every second. So it's happening. Nothing is fixed. Never has been, never will be. Once again, let's get back now. I was going to bring it up again, but I won't. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Um, yeah, partially. The one would be whether you have had any experiences, whether that effect that the uncertainty changes the possibilities. Have you had any personal experience or heard about any of your students that it works better for them suddenly or any in that direction? Yes. Definitely. I could, um, I, we could look at it. Um, this time, this last year on this earth has been a great time for uh, governments losing their credibility in the eyes of the people, religions losing their credibility in the eyes of their people. With everything that's happened in this world this year, none of these things that people have placed all of their credibility and faith in has come through. None of these things that people believed in has come through, except for the people that believe in themselves. These people have come through. So due to this, many, many people have relinquished their absolute faith on their governments, their absolute faith on their church, their absolute faith in their belief systems. They've relinquished a lot of it. And by relinquishing these things, you are freeing your mind. You are freeing up an enormous amount of free space in there because you've dropped these things. Um, a little bit of fear will come with it because it's up to you. Let's face it, we've been thrown into the deep end of personal survival once again. And when it comes to absolute real survival, there's only one person you can rely on, and that's you. So a lot of people are coming to self-reliance, which is a fantastic thing, because the moment you rely on someone else for anything, the moment you rely on someone for spirituality, for wisdom, for happiness, you have relinquished freedom of mind and freedom of spirit, because to follow anything other than yourself is the opposite of freedom the opposite of a free mind, the opposite of a free heart, and the opposite of a free spirit. And many of my students are realizing that. I'm getting emails and things from students that I haven't spoken to in 20 years um, coming out of the woodwork this year. And it's lovely. I absolutely love the fact that they're still there and they're still doing things and they have their own students now. Many of them are scientists. Um, with the objective of uh, uniting spirituality and the physical realm. Um, so yes, I guess that was a very long answer, but yes, I'm seeing lots of changes, all for the, all for the positive, all for the better. It doesn't matter what happens in the world. Um, evolution only goes forward. It can't go backwards. It can only go forward. So, you know, if, if, if this world was to be obliterated tomorrow, get smashed into by a huge meteorite, and that's the end of that, somewhere in that there would be an evolutionary process. There would be a point to it. Something good would come out of it. Um, that's just a fact. I think I answered your question there. It's all good. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next question is on intent. Um, what is the relationship between the lower and the higher mind when it comes to formulating intents that we put out into the world? The higher mind's intentional power is probably a lot stronger than that of the lower mind. But 
how much uh, does the higher mind do or how much can it do as long as the lower mind is fully in charge and is denying even the existence of the higher mind? Wow, that was good. The higher mind Okay, here we go. Imagine you have a bucket of water and the water in that bucket is so pristine clean, so clear, so pure, you can't even see that it's there until you wiggle it with your finger and then it becomes apparent. Let's say that that water represents the higher mind. So that's how you're born, pristine clean, no thoughts no problems, no knowledge. So that's how you are arrive into this world with that pristine clean mind. Now let's say next to the bucket, we have a big pile of dust, black dust, dirt. And every single grain of that dust represents a thought. Now, from the day you're born, bucket of clean water, till let's say you're five or 10 years old, Every minute of every day, someone is putting one of those grains of dirt into that bucket. This is a cup, this is wrong, this is bad, that's blue, this is where you live, this is your name, this is mummy, this is daddy, this is a car. Suddenly, uh, well, by the time you're five, 10 years old, that whole pile of dust is now in the bucket of crystal clear, beautiful, pristine water. But now you've got a bucket of mud. That's the lower mind. So, can we say that the higher mind is still there? Yes. Can it function as the higher mind? No, because it's saturated with the lower mind and the lower mind has absolute domination, dominant power at that point. The higher mind is bogged down through saturation. It's not suppressed or held down, it's bogged down through saturation. In the same way, you wouldn't be able to get up if you weighed 600 pounds. You'd be so fat and heavy, you wouldn't be able to move. You would be useless. You would be so saturated in fat, you would become invalid. You would become unable to function correctly. And it's the same with the mind. When the mind is absolutely gluttonized and saturated with these thoughts and opinions and judgments, the clear mind is gone. Well, it hasn't gone, it's still there. So, the process of the practices of enlightenment is to take that dust back out and put it back in a pile outside of you. And eventually, that crystal clear, pure mind is what's left. And that is full of joy, compassion, passion, curiosity all of the good things of life. All of the bad things come from the lower mind. The lower mind thinks there is such a thing as death. Now you have fear, you have wrong murders, you have all sorts of shit. This is gonna come from that, that one wrong thought. So that's the difference between the lower and the higher mind. They are unfortunately integrated, probably the wrong word, one permeates the other, and we have to re-separate. It's very difficult. Now, when you are just thinking, that's the lower mind, that's the mud moving around, like it's being shaken by emotions. When you are watching your thoughts, you are that pristine, clean awareness, being aware of the particles of mud that are in it. Does that make sense? So that is mind inside thought or saturated by thought. At that point, if all you can see is the lower mind, it doesn't take long before you start to think that that's what you are. Once you separate from that mud and you see the pile of mud that you used to identify with and think that it was you, once you've done that, that is the higher mind. You will never go back into the mud. You will never allow mud back into your bucket. 
your mind has always been pristine clean. It was just unfathomable to the lower mind. The lower mind is extremely limited. Every thought you have is delineated, which means it, it will, every thought cannot go past its delineation, it, its boundary. Spirit and life is limitless. So to try and grasp limitlessness through tools which are absolutely limited is an impossibility and you're pushing shit uphill. So over thousands and thousands of years, we've come up with ways to do this. Scientifically, people have tried different things, sacrifices to the gods, you know, it, it all started there. That's, <laughs> and it went on and on and on. They didn't work, of course. But the thing is, eventually over time, we've come up with techniques, we've come up with strategies, meditation being one of them, uh, flat lining is another one, you know, it took thousands of years. A lot of people died bringing this information to us. Many, many people, great heroes have died for this. Buddha, Jesus, if they were such people, I didn't just say there wasn't, I just, um, just float with that one. Um, so now we're at that usual point with me where I've gone so far into the question, uh, the answer, I don't remember the question, so I'm pretty sure I answered it. We good? <laughs> yep. We're, we're good. Uh, one more in that same direction is, um, is experiencing the higher mind equivalent to enlightenment? And uh, can you speak a bit more about what you consider as enlightenment? Oh, absolutely. Enlightenment is, it's only mysterious if you refuse to look at it. Enlightenment comes with a lot of wrong background information. Enlightenment comes with a lot of wrong or bad propaganda. Um, enlightenment, really, I just explained it in the previous question. Enlightenment is understanding and seeing the human condition and re-establishing yourself back into the position of mind that life put you in in the first place. That gave me a headache. So what I mean by that is the day you were born, pristine clean mind. Now you can't say that that mind has just been created by the mother and the father because it has not. Mind is not created. Mind is not matter. Created is some is, is a phenomenon you attribute to matter, the physical realm. So mind isn't created. It, it's not a physical phenomenon. It can't be touched. It can't be grasped. It can't be held. It can't be found. You can't locate it by cutting someone's head open. Um, it is something of a non-physical realm. It is of the spiritual realm. Now, understanding everything I just said before about this is how you were born, and then at a very early age, by the time you get to, you know, before your teenagehood, that pure, pure, pristine, clean, eternal mind that wasn't created, it, it's always been there. <clears throat> and when you see and understand that engaging life from this higher mind free of opinion and judgment and separation and confusion and all of these thought processes that separate you from the rest of life and the oneness of all things when you see that this is the problem in the world the only problem in the world and by that I mean we are the only creatures that wage war against each other we're the only creatures that wage war against other creatures so once you can see that when everyone comes from this higher mind life is easy it's loving it's selfless um, 
and the world would get a lot better and it would be a much better place for all concerned, not just people. Once you can see that, you understand what is to be done. Now, once you've studied and looked at and practiced all of the practices that have been designed to re-establish you in that higher mind, and you successfully make that transition and you stop identifying with the lower mind and its thought processes and its limitations, you have reached enlightenment. There's many things that come with that mind, that higher mind. It's been around forever and therefore it has the knowledge of forever in it. It can't die and therefore it has all of the mysteries of life in it. It is life. It is the instigator of all movement in life. When you intend to tell me something, what is that intention? How do you, it's not a thought. You have to intend to think before you can think. So intent comes long before thought. Intent is the original movement of spirit. So the intent of spirit is always to move forward, it's always to know, it's always to expand and be. The intent of the lower mind is to be prettier than the girl next door, to have bigger muscles than the man up the road, to get revenge on your father that spent 10 years ruining life. You may think that that's what he did, but he probably did not. The lower mind has intentions of having a better job than you. The lower mind wants more money. The lower mind wants a bigger Oops. The lower mind, you see, that's the difference. That's its intentions. The lower mind will get up early in the morning with full intentions of earning more money today so he can have a bigger house and a better car and all the rest of it. Not everyone's like that, and I'm, I'm speaking very generally, of course, but that's the lower mind. Its intentions are purely self-centered. The intentions or the intent of the higher mind is not. It is all-inclusive, always. And that's the higher mind. <laughs> so that's enlightenment. You can't go wrong with enlightenment. It's not mysterious. It's not beyond everyone. Everyone has it in them. but. If your need to be bigger than him or prettier than her or have more money than that person, if they're your intentions, you have no hope. <laughs> <laughs> and that can be fun too. So, you know, I'm pretty sure that one was answered. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So next question is a little longer. Um, oh, I would... <laughs> <laughs> Go on then. Okay. Um, recently, I watched two documentaries about different cults, and in them, many elements of what, what makes up a cult were described. For example, a cult needs to turn you into a conformist. You have to stop thinking for yourself. You have to become a true believer and not question anything that the authority puts out as facts. Uh, another aspect is creating an in-group and uh, then demonizing the out-group. So mm. division is also key. Also creating fear artificially and then provide a solution for that fear, which uh, usually involves giving up aspects of freedom. As I was watching these documentaries, I increasingly saw at least some parallels to society in general and particularly to the current global situation. My question is, uh, have we all been lured into a cult of conformity by politicians and mass media? And how do we get out of it if hardly anybody seems to see the cult-like patterns applied in our daily lives? Yes. Next question. I'm joking. Now, <laughs> yes, yes, by those definitions, yeah. Uh, it's been a strategy for a long time that governments create an enemy and then save you from the enemy. And sometimes that enemy is ISIS, sometimes the enemy is a virus, sometimes the enemy is God knows what. But 
aliens even i think back in the 80s a very famous speech in the where was it um there's a very famous speech that uh, ronald reagan president ronald reagan gave and he was saying how how all human this is in the cold war of course how all humans how the russians and the americans and all people of the earth would all come together if we all had a common enemy from another place from out of this world <clears throat> and that's pretty much not long after that they got rid of him because he was getting a bit demented <laughs> he was saying things that he shouldn't be saying he was talking about uh, blue book ufos that sort of thing aliens but the fact is it's been a strategy for a long time when when we become a little bit unruly when we start to think for ourselves when things aren't going right the governments will give us a common enemy even if they have to make one up and they do that quite often and then they'll save us from that enemy and then we've regained our uh, our credence in the governments our religions do the same thing the, the satan was there the one that they're going to save everyone from um if you are going to rule anyone you have to create an enemy you know, whether it's just a bad situation or whether it's an actual real physiological enemy they will create one and then save you from it cults do this of course religions do this governments do this so to answer your question yes yes that is what's happening and it's necessary for globalization uh, the planet will be a planetary cult that's the aim i have more faith in life than that life will stop this long before us monkeys go too far with it um where was i going with that so how do you get out of that it's a conundrum uh, but patience will win the day why because the people running the governments that are doing these things they're old people they are of a very old generation not the last generation most of them are from the generation before that so very old generations um, The generations today, let me back up a little bit. I got a bit lost there. If 50 or 60 years ago, you had seen a politician with a tattoo or an earring, a male politician with an earring, you wouldn't have gotten in. If that politician wasn't religious, he wouldn't have gotten very far at all. That's how it had to be. Slowly but surely, people dropped their judgments of these things. And now we have politicians with earrings and we have politicians with um, with tattoos, and some of them have even been great rock stars in their past. So we've dropped a lot of stuff there. That was the last generation. This generation is even more advanced. So what I'm getting at is each generation is learning more and more about globalization and what is going to be necessary for that to occur more and more of this generation are savvy to what's happening now you have to remember two or three generations ago before the internet it was uh, you know your savviness if you were a savvy person it would be because you are worldly it would be because you've traveled or you've been to university you would have spent half your lifetime studying the world and studying people of course today you can do that online in a month you can learn pretty much anything and everything you want to learn online for nothing without even leaving your home so this generation is so far more savvy than previous generations of the same age the problem though oh i'll finish that bit so when you're savvy to it that means you don't get angry don't get upset because these are things that you would get arrested for you, you 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 will come up you will put red flags up on computer screens if you start to become a troublesome civilian i'm trying very hard not to get into conspiracy stuff here 
Um, so with this generation, they're quite savvy as to what's going on. If they don't understand that globalization, we've been working towards that for a long time now. If they don't understand that, then um, there's something wrong with those people. So if you fight it, if you create war against people that are trying to create this globalization, you're not going to win. This, is, uh, this has been in the works. This has been planned for decades and decades and decades. Take it back to the Bilderbergs. The way to be, and I think Gandhi, this is what Gandhi has given us, Mahatma Gandhi, be a nice person, live your own life, do the right thing, exercise your love and your passion and your compassion for each other and for life. Understand that our governments are our administration blocks. This is what why we gave them the job. When a club, and I, I'm talking about countries as clubs here, a country is a club. A country has a certain way of thinking, certain philosophies, certain laws, certain services. And if you like that club, you'll join the club and you'll pay your fees, which are taxes, but you'll pay your fees and you get to enjoy the services and the philosophies of that club. Now, if you look at every country like that, there are countries that don't have good philosophies and you might not want to join those. Anyway. Once you have a club and it's a very good club and lots of people enjoy your philosophies and your services, so they join your club, they become part of your country. Now, if that club gets too big and there are too many members, it's too much work for a couple of old ladies to be doing the accounts and to be ordering the alcohol if there happens to be a bar in that club. It becomes a bit too much, so you have to employ or create an administration department, and that administration department will look after all of that, all of the bookings and all of the food and all of the imports and exports, and you will pay them, and you will pay them a good wage to do that because they are a great part of your club and the way it's going in life. Now, if your staff members that are running the administration department starts to tell you who you can sleep with and what time you have to be at work every day and what you're allowed to eat and what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say, you're going to turn around to your staff members and go, you're fired, you suck. Oops. <laughs> Off. Why don't we do that to our government? That's all that's happening. You are in a country with 20 million people or more. The accounts need to be looked after. You need an administration block, which is your government. And yet when they turn around and start telling us who we can sleep with and what we can say and what we can't say and all of the rest of it, we do nothing about it. So it's that simple. Once you understand these things, the only thing you need to do to be happy in life and to have a nice country and still have freedom of spirit and mind and speech, just be a nice person, love each other, get on well, do the right thing, work with each other when you have to, make sure everyone's got enough space to be in their own peace when they need to be. If your administration block starts to tell you what you should be doing in life, you get rid of them and replace them with better staff that's going to do what they're told, then suddenly you've got a wonderful club. It'll never go wrong and you'll all start moving forward in life again. Not hard. And that's what this generation has to get their head around. This is the last free generation. Happy Christmas. <laughs> So one last question I have is uh, related uh, to the conversation with uh, Tom Campbell I recently had. Uh, I think you also watched it and you said you might have a few things to add. So one one aspect I'd like you to talk about is um, related to this um, confirmation of our worldview um, that we intend and the uh, the aspects that through the manipulation we experience, we might have our worldview manipulated and then 
have this manipulated worldview influence our intentions and probably create a world that we don't really want. And I'd just be interested in your whole view on this uh, on this topic. Mm. To clarify, are we talking about how our view, the way we view things actually shapes the way things come out by the way we view it? Well, that would just be the perception aspect. Uh, in, the, in the talk with Tom Campbell, we, we also, we, perception was one thing he was talking about, uh, perception, interaction, were the more clear things. And then the last one was the intention. And his worldview, his model says that with our intention, we influence what uh, the, the things, how things come out in the world. We also do it with the perception, that's one thing, but also with the intention. And I would be more interested in the whole intention aspect, whether you, how you see that uh, influencing reality and how a manipulated worldview might change that intention because it wants to confirm the worldview we experience. Yeah, absolutely. Intention is everything. Intention is like the Higgs boson. Intention shapes everything that comes after it. Um, I'm trying to come up with an example of intention here. If you wish to create, hypothetically, if you wish to create a wonderful resort where people can go to the resort and have everything provided for them so that they can, uh, good food, um, nice quiet music, wonderful atmosphere, five-star dwellings, um, perhaps an ocean, perhaps an island with the ocean lapping up on the beaches. This is your intention, is to create this for people so that people can come and have an absolute wonderful time away from their everyday humdrum life. Now, what would your intention be? If your intention is purely for the love of people, purely because you perceive that the world needs more of these types of places. You'd be very lucky if it succeeded, <laughs> unfortunately. If your intention is to do all of that, knowing full well that people will benefit from it greatly, but your intention is to make money, you will probably succeed. Now we get to judgment. Is that the right reason to be doing it or is that the wrong reason to be doing it? See, the intent will create the situation Either way, it will create, uh, how can I put this? This is very difficult because intent is before the thought process, so I'm not getting any pictures with it. The intent flavors something. I could give you a flower. Let's say the smell of a flower represents intention. If you see a flower and visibly this flower is one of the most gorgeous flowers you've ever seen and then you smell the flower but the, the smell of the flower is so pungent it repels you and you can you know it involuntarily you just go Whoa! The, the smell is so bad that has just ruined everything you will never smell that flower again any flower that looks like that is going to bring that up you're going to associate it with the flower you just saw. Any flower that looks like that, you're going to be a little bit more uh, wary of just walking up and smelling it. So the intent of that first flower representing, uh, sorry, the smell of the first flower, the horrible smell of the first flower representing intention. Once you have partaken of that first flower with its bad intent, it has flavored everything else you do 
from that point on. Anything else that looks like that, anything that you can associate with that first flower is going to be tainted with that horrible smell. It's going to bring it up. Every time you see a flower that looks like that one, it's going to remind you of that smell. This is not a very good example, but bear with me. If you produce a wonderful paradise, your intent will always be in your manifestation. I've seen this happen. I've seen people open up monasteries with the intent of wanting to be a spiritual leader, someone who hasn't done the work. They just want to be a spiritual leader and they want to be special in the eyes of other others. Um, that intent destroys everything. I know people who have opened up monasteries and schools pretending to be enlightened. Um, the monasteries and schools, for all intents and purposes, are a good thing because they open people's minds up to enlightenment. They open people's minds up to spirituality. If nothing else, it teaches people that they can sit down and take control of their mind and at least still their heart and their mind a little. At least that you can get from it. But because of the intent behind what the person did, uh, or why the person opened the place up in the first place, i.e. to be special in the eyes of others, that will all go wrong. Someone will say something one day that um, is incongruent with your intent and suddenly you might get angry for a moment and the other people will see you get angry and they'll go, no, hang on a minute, that's a bit incongruent with what this guy's teaching. And now it turns to shit. Now everyone that came to you or to this person is now going to be suspicious of other teachers. The intent of that person has now just stained other teachers, teachers that could have done the right thing, teachers that could have taken you a lot further in your spirituality. Um, but that will all be thwarted. Why? Because this first person that you went to did something with the wrong intention. I know that's got nothing to do with the original question that you asked me, but that's a fact. Your intent flavors everything. If you look into the Higgs boson, the Higgs boson dictates whether a particle is going to become a hydrogen molecule or a whatever. It dictates the size or the weight of the particle. And your intention, our intention, will dictate the outcome of anything that we do. It is always there in the background. It doesn't matter how you try and cover up your intention, your intention will always bleed through because it's powerful stuff. And that's the point and that's the problem. So, yes, if propaganda through our TVs and all the rest of it give us the perception of a world, a dangerous world, where we, we need some huge body to protect us, that will influence the way we act. Slowly but surely, unbeknownst to us and out of our own sight, we will start to become more timid. We will start to become, the men will become more effeminate, etc., etc. It's already happened a lot in the world in other ways, but that's another hour's worth of talking. So, yes. Our perceptions influence our intentions and our intentions influence our perceptions. And the fact that there are bodies out there that have spent many, many, many decades and trillions of dollars learning how to manipulate our perceptions means that they have absolute control over our intentions and vice versa. Intentions. See, there's another one. If it's the intentions of the higher mind, I'm not going to go on with that one. <laughs> Sorry. So. Yeah, I think it's getting dark on your end. Probably it's getting very sign. dark on my end. <laughs> <laughs> it's very black. I think we've got a storm coming. Okay. Well. I would like to talk about a lot more about intention, but um, I'm not sure if it's going to work today. Intent well, is 
you see if you remember at the beginning of this interview we were talking about the higher mind and the lower mind and the intentions of the higher mind are always altruistic and they are always all inclusive the intentions of the lower mind are always self-centered always so when it comes to intent and what you're talking about the world our world view is of the lower mind because the world we live in does not put anything into our spirituality i'm speaking generally it doesn't put any money into our spirituality or effort it doesn't put any money or or effort into our self-reliance and our self-worth it puts everything I'm going to leave it there. I'm getting lost. You might have to cut that. Excuse me. You might have to cut that bit out. It's a thick. It's a thick um, subject. The intent, because I don't think the government or the bodies that are doing this. I don't think they are taking the spiritual mind or the higher mind into account, because they've put so much effort and so much time with so much scientific propaganda to put down any spiritual practices or to put down any so-called paranormal or supernatural effects that people have the ability to do that it's not really an issue in the minds of the governments anymore it's not really a problem for them they don't really have to address it religions kind of do that um so when it comes to the government affecting our perception of the world, it's purely to the lower mind. And as I said, not too long ago, if you work on reestablishing your seat in the higher mind and you engage life from that, world perceptions won't be an issue for you. You won't have a world perception. You will only have a perception of life and which way life is going and how to be one with that life and how to enjoy your portion of life and not have to be a part of or manipulated by anything other of the lower mind which would be what we were talking about before government perceptions and all the rest of it <sighs> i'm going to go now <laughs> well, thank you very much. For your time. It was uh, was a really very interesting and good interview. Thank you very much again. Oh, my pleasure, Oliver. Always a pleasure. Um, and I'll see you soon. Yeah, see you soon.